<laughs> so good morning, everybody. Boker Tov, good to see you. Nice to have you all here. Nice to have you back, those of you who are sitting, those of you who are eating. Uh, it's good to have you all here. Um, I want to uh, sort of bring Bishal Akum to a conclusion today and move on into... <laughs> and move on. I know all the time I'm going to do Bishal Akum, Bishal Akum. Now when I come in next week, what am I going to say? I don't know. All right, listen, Baruch Hashem, Raz, it's good to sometimes not know, you know? It's, uh, we, we don't want to make life too... Sometimes it's better not to know. <laughs> we don't want to make life too predictable. Uh, so I want to, I want to finish, uh, I want to finish Bishal Akum and then move on to another area of um, sim- something similar to Bishal Akum, which we'll talk about, uh, that will be, ki- we're going to be learning about Pas Akum, uh, which is bread baked by a non-Jew, and we'll ultimately be learning also about chalav akum, right? Milk um, that was uh, milked from a uh, no, from a an animal not under the where the milk was milked by a non-Jew, or not under the supervision of a Jew. And finally, we will bring the whole thing to a conclusion uh, by talking uh, about yayin wine that uh, a non-Jew has come into contact with, uh, which can be actually a very, very costly uh, mistake sometimes. So we'll look at all of these. But we're, we, gotta, we still have a long way to go before we get to the end. But what I want to do today is sort of finish up Bishal Akum and start Pas Akum. So we still have a number of issues that have to be dealt with. Number one, Steve asked the question uh, many, many weeks ago, that uh, Bishal Akum, by definition, seems to be restricted to the cooking of an Akum. What is an Akum? The word Akum is, a, uh, is an abbreviation that stands for a person who is Oved Kochavim Umazalos, meaning someone who, in our language, would be called an idolater, someone who actually worships <coughs> stars, uh, uh, the, the sun, the moon, constellations. <clears throat> that, uh, that would be, right, that's an idolater, right? That's an idolater. So Steve, in his, uh, in his you know, usual fashion, to be precise, wanted to understand, <clears throat> does it apply only to an idolater? Or does it apply today to anyone who's not Jewish? <clears throat> even if that person is not an idolater? An interesting question. We call it Bishal Akum. <clears throat> is it only Akum? Now, <clears throat> at one point, I would say, you know, the, our exposure, our interaction with idolaters is really few and far between. However, in society today, that's actually not true. It might have been true 10 years ago. It might have been true 20 years ago. It's less true today than it was then. There are many, many more people with whom we interact, particularly in, the, in, in certain fields, um, that individuals who populate those fields come from countries and still adopt practices <coughs> of countries that actually worship idols, in many cases, animals. And that is, you know, open and shut of Oldazara. So clearly it would apply to such individuals, but would it apply even beyond that? Does it apply to the average non-Jew who doesn't worship idols? Does it apply to the average non-Jew uh, who maybe is a, maybe is a religious uh, Christian, maybe not? Does it apply to a Muslim, right? Does it apply to a Muslim? A Hindu, Hindu is clearly within the category of a Vodazara, right? We don't... We don't have to ask any questions about a Hindu because, you know, if a person is a religious Hindu, so that's Avodazara, right? Now, again, you might be referring to Hindus who are not observant Hindus. I don't know, right? To observant Hindus, observant Hindus, it's really Avodazara, right? And I'm not, it's, not a, it's not a value judgment. It's just that it, it is, it's a messias, right? It is, it is Avodazara. You're born a Hindu. What? You're born a Hindu. That's cut and dry. 
Well, yeah. Yeah. And there's no someone who's religious, not religious, hasn't practiced any belief or. Uh, no, 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 no. What makes a Hindu? I mean, if one is. Uh, I don't know what their qualification and what their standard is. Yeah, yeah, it's the wall against the wall. Multiple gods. <laughs> No, so when, when we talk about a Voldazara, we're talking about somebody who practices a Voldazara, not somebody who is born into a religion. I don't, is Hindu a religion? It's a Hindu is a nationality. I don't want to be racist here, Steve. It's a, it's a religion. Hindu is a religion? Yes? Yeah, Hindu yes? Is a Hinduism is a religion? Yeah. How is it Cousin, cousin, second cousin, <laughs> right? So, so if someone is a Hindu, that means that they are an adherent to Hinduism. Is that correct? Am I? Uh, they are. So there's no such thing. So there's no such thing as a non-observant Hindu. Is that correct? Yeah. Like a non. Well, like there's no such thing as a non-observant Jew. It doesn't exist. I think it will it tell you what... Or hang on, Henry, hang on a second. Norman is... Our oncologist is Indian, and he's a practicing Hindu. If we didn't have an appointment with him, he would always call us right before Rosh Hashanah to wish us a good year. Oh. And I said, may God be with you. I don't remember what I said. And as a joke, he said, which one? <laughs> I think that explains... Well, but he's a practicing Hindu. Absolutely. Can you have not, I mean, you can have practicing Jews and you can have non-practicing Jews, right? You can have Jews who are, quote, observant and you can have Jews who are, quote, not observant, right? So can you have the same thing by Hindus? Are there, so Hen, Henry is saying yes. Henry is saying that there are non-practicing Hindus. In other words, maybe people who have been born into that religion, but don't practice. Maybe no different than a Jew who is born into being a Jew by birth, but is not a practicing Jew, not, a, not an observant Jew. So you can have non observant So when we talk about someone who's an Oved of Odazara, we're talking about someone who, who practices, practices a religion that is based on a multiplicity of divinities, if you will. What if you're a Hindu? Ooh, okay. Right, come on. But, but your question is whether I, whether they are practicing or not, whether whether they fall under. Uh, no. So they only no. So so only people who practice of Odazara are considered as Ovde of Odazara. Okay. Now, what about people who don't practice of Odazara but who are not Jewish, right? Do they come under the category of Bishalakum? Meaning, you know, if if uh, sure. if um, uh, if Dario uh, plugs in the cholent Friday afternoon, is that considered bishalakum? Is that considered bishalakum? <coughs> so, um, if you stir, what? If you stir, forget my. I'm not stirring. I'm not doing anything. I'm just asking if he plugs it in, he stirs it, he takes care of everything. He's not an Oved of Odazara, but is it, is it considered Bishalakum? So the answer to this is yes, it is considered Bishalakum. Why? Because remember, what was the reason for the institution of the uh, prohibition of Bishalakum? To avoid intermarriage. Mishum chasnos, right? To avoid intermarriage. What does that mean? That means that anyone with whom intermarriage would be forbidden would be within the category of Bishalakum. So I, I, I'm not allowed to marry this non-practicing Hindu. I'm not allowed to marry this non-practicing Muslim, right? That's intermarriage. It, whether whether is it Muslims by definition are not in the category of Oved of Odazara, Hindus practicing might be, but it doesn't really matter because I can't marry, not allowed to marry anyone who's not Jewish. So anyone who's not Jewish is therefore within this prohibition of Bishalakum. Okay, so that clarification number one that we needed to know. And this will apply, by the way, not just to Bishalakum, but to any of the rabbinic prohibitions that were instituted to avoid to minimize social interaction, it will all fall under the same category of 
a non-Jew, not, sim- not simply someone who's an Oved of Odazara. What? Such as? Such as Pas Akum, such as Gevinas Akum, the bread of a non-Jew, the cheese of a non-Jew, Yayin, right, wine that belongs to a non-Jew or that was touched by a non-Jew, there will, get a li- there will become a little bit more relevant. Uh, the the Voda Zara component of it, but in general it will apply across the board. So that's number one. What is the cheese coming to the picture? Right, if I have to tell you everything right now, you don't need me. You can shoot me and put me out the pasture. So, okay, right. So what do we have? So we have this idea that Bishal Akum, as well as any of the other Akums, uh, Pas Akum, Gvinas Akum, uh, Yayin Nesech, Stam Yenam, all of that applies to uh, non. Jews, whether they are Oved of Odazara or not Oved of Odazara. Okay, good. Now, uh, the final ish, the final question of Bishal Akum that I want to bring up is we've learned that Bishal Akum applies when it comes to cooking, the regular modality of cooking. And if you remember last week, we also learned about the, the difference between the Sephardim and the Ashkenazim as to how much of the cooking process the Jew needs to be involved with, and whether or not an Ashkenazi could rely on, I'm sorry, whether or not a Sephardi could rely on an Ashkenazi heter, an Ashkenazi hashkacha, that's based on the Ashkenazi definition of bishalako. Okay. Good. Uh, we, we talked about there's a stringency, a leniency. Okay. Does Rich. ownership apply here? Ownership of what? Well, let's say you want to buy kosher wine from. A We're store. not talking about wine. Kosher anything that's owned by a. Non- we don't care who owns it. We don't care who owns it. In other words, uh, uh, you know, somebody, uh, somebody who's somebody who's not Jewish owns a whatever. You can you can buy from it, right? You, it's not a, as long as the as long as the food is kosher, as long as the food is certified kosher. Okay. Now, here's the final piece, and that is, if I have if I want to cook by microwave, is that considered cooking? Right? Is microwave considered cooking? So, uh, the fir- at first glance, what would you say? Yes. yes. Yes, right? Microwave is considered cooking. Why? Because, right, we cook, right, by microwave. People cook by microwave. Now, the truth is, most people don't cook by microwave. Most people reheat food that was cooked using the microwave. Relatively few people cook by microwave. Why? They don't know how. Because it's not easy. Right? It's not easy. Cooking by microwave is not easy. I mean, it might be easy to bake a potato, right? Or, or you know, I want to bake a potato, so I'll bake a potato using a microwave. Or, or, I'll, uh, or I'll cook my frozen broccoli, right, using a microwave. But very, very, relatively few people are cooking, uh, you know, real food, chicken and meat and, and fish, using, using a microwave. They're generally using it to either to defrost something or to heat something up. But... I think you're right. At first glance, it would seem, of course, it's a method of cooking. Why is a, why am I even raising this question? Why am I even raising the question about a microwave? Because if you remember, we learned that there are different modalities of cooking, some modalities of cooking to which the laws of Bishal Akum apply, and some modalities of cooking to which the laws of Bishal Akum do not apply. So for instance, when we talk about bishul akum, we've been talking. What is the traditional bishul? What does the word bishul mean? It means to cook, but how? Fire. It means to cook through a sub through a liquid that has been heated by a fire. That's what bishul is, right? To cook by a liquid that has been heated by a fire. That's bishul. It's actually to cook with a with a hot liquid. Now. What about if I, so that's clear, if I, have a, if I have a gas stove or a propane stove, okay, so I have an actual fire. What if I have an electric stove? What if I have an electric stove and, and I'm cooking on the electric stove? That's still Bisho, why? Because it's still, the, elect, the electrical element is doing what? Is heating up 
the liquid in which you are cooking your meatballs, your whatever you're cooking in there. Ross? Your kosher wine has to be mevushal. Yeah. Right? It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. In order for it to be kosher, it has no, to be. No. It doesn't have to be. Kosher wine, kosher wine, and mevushal wine are often the same thing, but can be different. In other words, many kosher wines are mevushal, but there are also many kosher wines that are not mevushal. What is mevushal? Mevushal means cooked. It's not, bo it's pasteurized. It's pasteurized. So it has to be heated to a particular temperature. Exactly what that temperature is, is something important that we will discuss when we talk about, uh, when we talk about uh, wine. Uh, but just think about it for a moment. I don't know if I have any wine connoisseurs here. Uh, from the fact that you're at an 8.30 class, I'd probably say no, right? <laughs> but but, uh, but uh, a wine connoisseur is not going to drink a pasteurized wine. Why? because the cooking, the heating process impacts on the taste of the wine. I, I, I actually met somebody, you know, I always joke about, I always joke about a wine connoisseur, but I actually met somebody who was a real wine connoisseur, and he said, the worst way to taste wine is in a metal kiddish cup. <laughs> he says, in, the, in, a, in a metal kiddish cup. So it's actually the worst way to taste wine, right? You have to taste it out of a glass, out of a wine glass. Because even the metal, you know, makes the wine taste funny, the, right? The I, I have not been blessed with such a sense of taste. What? The one is kosher wine. In other words, the Jew is taking, taking care of the wine, the whole process. Right. It doesn't have to be the bushel. Right. I, I don't want to get I don't want to get too involved in that discussion, right? Because then you'll be able to skip that week, right? I don't want to get too involved in that discussion, but but yes, right? Yes, if you if you. If you have wine which is not mevushal, it must be handled only by a Jew. Whether it needs to be a religious Jew or a not religious Jew, Jerry, we're going to come, we'll talk a little bit about that as we get there. All right, we'll get there. Okay? All right, right. So what do we, so, so clearly the traditional bishal term that we use is a hot liquid. Whether that liquid became hot through a flame underneath it, or whether that liquid became hot through, uh, you know, through an electric element. Um, that's bishul. When we talk, there's another method of, that's what we call cooking, but there's another method of cooking, which we don't refer to as bishul, but nevertheless it is cooking. And what is that? <coughs> that's baking or roasting, right? Baking or roasting is done through how not a hot liquid. It is done simply through the modality of heat, right? You put a cake in the oven, right? You put a cake in the oven. You put uh, a, a meat in the oven, right? You put chicken, whatever you put in the oven. Now, there might be some liquid that is connected with that. There might be like a pot roast or something like that. There could be liquid. But generally, if the, if the food is cooked, a pot roast is not cooked by the boiling liquid which is in the pot roast, right? which is in the bottom of the pot. That's not how it's cooked. Right? It's cooked from the heat of the oven. So that's, that is called baking. Actually, very interestingly, from a Bishal Akum perspective, we don't care whether it was baked or whether it was, or whether it was roasted or whether it was cooked in a hot liquid or whether it was cooked directly on top of the coals. We don't care about any of that. From a Shabbos perspective, that is important to know. From a Shabbos perspective, that's important to know. Why? I'll share with you the following idea, okay? That we have a principle when it comes to the laws of Shabbos that say, Ein bishul achar bishul. What does that mean, Ein bishul achar bishul? So once something has been cooked once, you can't violate cooking on Shabbos a second time. In other words, once it's been cooked, it can't be halachically cooked a second time, meaning once something has reached the stage at which it is considered cooked, 
So it can't be halachically recooked. It can't be halachically cooked again, okay? Now, that's interesting. Uh, it's interesting, a very important difference between Ashkenazim and Sephardim when it comes to this area. So let, let's get, let me give you an example of where we would apply Ein Bishul Achar Bishul. Okay, let's say I have uh, I have a uh, I have uh, no 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 I have a uh, I have a piece of chicken. Uh, no, I don't want to use a piece of chicken. Um, no, I want to use something that was cooked in um, in a liquid. I want to use something that was cooked in a uh, all right. Uh, Okay, so, um, all right, so uh, I'll, I'll make it, I'm going to, I'm going to, broccoli. broccoli's not a food. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, right, so let's, let's, uh, I'll, I'll, tr I'll try to do it a little bit of a different way, okay? Let's say I, I have bread, I have a piece of bread, okay? Bread is, how is bread cooked? Baked. 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 Bread is baked, meaning it is baked by heat, not a hot liquid. It is baked by heat, okay? Right. Now, I can't rebake that bread on Shabbos. Once it's baked, I can't rebake it on Shabbos. So I can take bread and I can put the bread in my, uh, in my uh, warmer, I could put the bread on top of my blech, right, to warm it up, and I don't have to worry about how hot it gets. Even if it's, I break it open and it's steaming, I don't care, why? Because once it's been cooked, once it's been baked, it can't be baked again. Oh, okay, good. Now, what if Friday night, I have my uh, pot of soup, I have my plate of right my my plate of soup. I'm sitting at the table. I have my plate of soup, and I want to take my challah, and I want to break it up into pieces, and, dip it in. and I want to put it in my soup. Put it in my soup. <laughs> Am I allowed to do that? Am I allowed to do that? Am I allowed to break up my challah and to put it into my soup? You just dip it in. What's the difference? Dip it in, put it in. What's the difference? You have to. Oh. You have All right. To. So, okay. So Raz, so Raz is actually invoking a Talmudic principle. She doesn't know it, but she's actually invoking a Talmudic principle. And what is that Talmudic principle? There are times where the Gemara says, you want to know what the halacha is? Go out and see what the people are doing. Right? Go out and see what the people are doing. If the people are doing something, so then, so then the people would not be doing the wrong thing. Now, I don't know if you can apply that today, but certainly in the days of the Gemara, that was a, it was something that was applied. In fact, it was some, something that the Gemara would sometimes say, go out and see what the people are doing. So Raz is saying, every Jewish person breaks up challah or dips challah in soup. Of course it's permissible. And Raz is correct. It is permissible. But, and there's always a but, right? But, if I were to take my soup off of my blech, right? I have my pot of soup, my pot of chicken soup on my blech Friday night, right? I take it off of my blech and I want to break up the challah and put it in the pot of chicken soup. Am I allowed to do that? I'm not putting the pot back anywhere. Pot what's is going to sit on the camp. What's the difference between putting it in your pot or putting it in the bowl? Oh, that's the question. That's the question. Is there a difference between putting it in the pot and putting it in the soup? Yes. And the answer is yes. Jerry, what's the difference? I don't know, but if you were <laughs> <laughs> Le Leading the witness, right? Joan, you know the difference? No, I just I knew that it was always a question. Uh, okay, so here's the difference, all right? When it comes to Shabbos, we have gradations of cooking. The first, the first uh, category or grade of cooking is a pot al gabe ha'esh. 
a pot which is sitting on top of a heat source. That pot is called a Kli, anybody know? Kli Rishon. It's the mama pot, if you will, right? It's the first grade pot. It's the Kli Rishon. It's the source, which is sitting on a heat source. You are not allowed, as we learned, you can't lift the lid of that pot to check in. You can't stir that pot while it's on top of the fire. You can't put spices into that pot while it's on top of the fire. All of those things are prohibited because anything that you do in a Kli Rishon, which is Al Gabe Ha'esh, which is on top of the fire, is considered cooking. So you can't do that, okay? I take my pot off of the fire. I've lowered the grade of this pot. It's still a Kli Rishon because anything in which something was cooked, the, the original cooking container is defined as the Kli Rishon. So it's still a Kli Rishon, but it's no longer Al Gabe Ha'esh. So it's been diminished just a little bit, but not enough. So therefore, if I would take bread and break up the bread and put the bread in the pot, even if I'm going to now ladle it out and put it into bowls, I have done something wrong because the bread is being cooked now in a manner different than the way in which it was originally cooked. How was the bread originally cooked? Baked. 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 It was baked. It was baked through heat, through a dry heat. What's happening to the bread now? Now the bread is being heated up through a hot liquid. Something which is heated up through a hot liquid is different than something which is he heated up from a dry heat. So I am, in effect, cooking the bread. So how is that? Why can I use it? Why can I then put it in my bowl? Because the soup, once the soup goes into my bowl, what is the bowl? The bowl is considered a cliché, a secondary vessel. And if the bowl is considered a cliché, a secondary vessel, it is not halachically hot enough to halachically cook that bread. So therefore, I can put it in to my bowl of soup. It's a cliché. Here's, here's a common example that we all know about. I want to make a cup of tea on Shabbos. I want to make a cup of tea on Shabbos. What do I do? You take the tea bag. Uh, so, all right, so I see we already have machlokes rishonim. All right, right, you want to, right, right, you, I want to make, uh, okay, so you have an urn, you, right, the urn is a kli rishon. The urn is by definition a kli rishon. It is al gabe ha'esh. There's no fire there, but there's a heat source underneath it. That's an electric heat source. That's why it's plugged in. That's why you have the light, right? It's an electric heat source. That is considered, the urn is considered a kli rishon. I take water out of that urn into a cup. The cup now has the status of a kli sheni, okay? I pour from that cup into a second cup. That second cup now has the status of a Kli Shalishi. And we say that even things which are as easily cooked as tea leaves can't be halachically cooked in a Kli Shalishi. Okay, now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause for a second to share the following with you, okay? None of what I just said is scientific. It's not scientific. If you make a cup of tea in a cliché, it's going to look the same as a cup of tea in a cliché. It's not going to look any different. And the drop in temperature, the drop in temperature of the water, from a cliché to a cliché is minimal. minimal, minimal. The drop of temperature. If you were to measure the temperature in an urn, 
measure the water of the temperature of an urn. And then you would pour it into a cup and you would measure the temperature of water in that cup. It would be, the difference would be minimal. Now, if you let the cup just sit there, obviously it's going to cool off. But I'm talking about right away, the difference is minimal. I then pour it into a, another cup, which is a klishlishi, and I take the temperature, I measure the temperature of the water, it is minimal. It's less, but it's minimal. So this is not a scientific proposition. This is a halachic construct. It's a halachic construct. The rabbis have said that klirishon cooks, Klishlishi does not cook, okay? Even if you tell me scientifically the difference in temperature between a klirishon and a klishlishi is maybe, I don't know, five degrees? Maybe five degrees? Nevertheless, this is not a scientific definition of cooking. It is a halachic definition so of cooking, okay? You know, the knowledge we have now is different to a degree than what they did when they created the laws. Why does it still apply? It, it still, it, it it still applies relevant. because this is the halacha construct, meaning no, I, I that what know. happens, the rabbis believe that when you pour from a kli rishon into a kli sheni, there is a dissipation of the heat. Now there is, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. There is a dissipation of the heat. The, the air absorbs some of the heat. The cup into which you've poured absorbs some of the heat. Now you are pouring into a klishlishi. The air again is going to absorb some of the heat. That, that second cup is going to absorb some of the heat. And the rabbis say once that much heat has been absorbed from the original source, we don't consider that halachically cooking. The, the rabbis were defining halachically cooking by these sources, not by actual measurement of temperature. But because they, maybe they didn't know exactly. Whatever, you know, what, what I'm saying is. I, I know what you're saying is because we can, now, right, but, but what I'm saying to you is you're basing your definition of cooking on the temperature of the water. Rabbis did not base it on the temperature of the water. That's the difference. Steve, go ahead. What happens when you do a reverse process? I take something from the refrigerator, like an ice cube, and I put it into something that's warmer. <laughs> okay, so so are you what are you asking you asking I'm me if I, if I have the concept if I have way. right, have I cooked have I cooked that ice, ice cube? cube? All right? Because what have I done? I've taken an ice cube and I've melted the ice cube in a glass of water. So have I cooked that ice cube, right? You've heated it. No. I've heated it. No, you've you accelerated it the process. You've you heated it away. You've you melted it. And it's like I'm going for okay. the Chinese thing. All right, so, so, um, so the, the answer is no, it's not considered bichel, right? Taking, allowing an ice cube to melt is not considered bichel. There might be other issues with allowing an ice cube to melt, which we're not gonna go into, but it's not, it's not a category of bichel, Howie. So, we you just you said before that ain't bishul acha bishul, right? So why then, when you have some bread that has been baked, and you now drop it into a pot that has been that has hot water in it or a soup or whatever, that that is us? Awesome. Why why should because that be bishul acha bishul? Because there are two methods. Two. Ein bishul achar bishul means there's no, you can't cook something that's been cooked. That's all within one method. In other words, if something has been cooked with boiling water, it can't be recooked with boiling water. If something has been baked through dry heat, it can't be rebaked through dry heat. So you're saying it can actually, if but, you take a baked item into uh, water, it can correct, be recooked? Correct, correct, correct. That's exactly what I'm saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. Yes. Sorry, I, 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 I'm not sure if we're going to have time to get back to the microwave. So I don't mind going off on a side tangent <laughs> on microwaves. Okay. Okay, I think many, many people, I'm generalizing now, I've got two ovens, dairy and meat. I don't know how many people have two microwaves. And what happens if you put meat in one and milk in the oven? Okay, so uh, Leslie's asking a very good question, a very interesting question. And that is, many people today have two ovens. I will tell you, I grew up with one oven. 
My house, we always had one oven. I got married, I only had one oven. I, one oven. I didn't know two ovens. I came to Great Neck, I had two ovens, <laughs> right? But until I came to Great Neck, I only had one oven, right? One oven. You know, we say most people today have two ovens. You have to define where you're talking about most people, mm -hmm. right? Right? You know, th there are people who have two ovens, but many people have one oven. So I have one oven. Okay. I what a one microwave. Mm -hmm. So what do I do? How do I cook milchiks and fleshiks using one oven? How do I cook milchiks and fleshiks using one microwave? How do I, what about if I only have one dishwasher? Chas mm -hmm. I only have one dishwasher, right? So can I cook milchiks, can I clean milchiks and fleshiks mm -hmm in my dishwasher. So these are, these are great questions. Obviously will take us a little bit far afield to, to do that. I will tell you what I, will tell you what I do. Uh, and that is that I, in my, I have one microwave. There are people who have milchik microwaves and fleshik microwaves. I'm not saying you shouldn't, but I happen to have one microwave and I use that microwave both for milchiks and fleshiks, not at the same time, <laughs> right? I use that microwave for milchiks and for fleshiks, and both are covered. In other words, whenever I cook fleshiks in the microwave, it is covered, and whenever I cook milchiks in the microwave, it is covered. I never ever cook something in the microwave that is not covered. Jerry. Uh, why, I, I, I lost something along the line. Why is the tea, necessary for clean shlishi, but the bread that we were talking about that you put in your soup plate is only a clean Because tea leaves are in the category of something called kale habishol, which means they become more easily cooked than bread, right? So bread, which doesn't become so easily cooked, I could put it in my soup, which is a clean right? Tea leaves, which become more easily cooked, I want to put in a klishlishi as opposed to a klisheni. Okay. Iraj. Is there a, you have a klishlishi. Is there a difference if I pour the water in the cup first, then put the tea bag? Or have a tea bag, then pour the water? Okay, so now, now we're drilling down here. All right. Is there a difference if I put the tea bag in the cup before I pour the water from the second cup? I put the tea bag in the third cup, and then I pour the water from the second cup, or do I have to pour the water from the second cup first and then put the tea bag in? So the halacha is that ideally you should pour the water first and then put the tea bag in. Why? Because even though I told you there's a kli rishon, there's a kli sheni, there's a kli shlishi, there are actually intermediary, intermediate steps. So pouring from a Kli Rishon into a Kli Shani is called Irui Kli Rishon. Pouring from a Kli Shani into a Kli Shlishi is called Irui Kli Shani. So Irui, the, which means pouring, has more, brings it once closer to where it's coming from. So when I, so I have a Kli Shani, right? I, I, I filled up the cup from my urn, okay? I have a cliche. -ny. Now, if I put the tea bag in the second cup and pour the water over it, that is one step closer to the cliche, because irui cliche, than if I first pour the water in and then put the tea bag and then put the tea bag in. Which that is the preferable to, to put the water in first and then to put the tea bag in. What about instant coffee? That's all that you touch this stuff. <laughs> Instant coffee is already cooked. Right. And since instant coffee is already cooked, right, we apply the principle of Ein Bishol Achar Bishol. Right? It, how do you cook coffee? It roasted, right? Uh, the coffee beans. beans are roasted. The beans are roasted. Instant are roasted. Instant and then ground. Really good. Yeah, they're roasted and then ground. We make coffee in a cliche, meaning I'll fill up an ur I'll fill up a, a cup from the urn, right. and I will then pour, I will then pour water, 
uh, into, I'm sorry, I fill up a cup from the urn and, and then I will then put coffee directly into that cup. Right. I don't, we don't require a klishlishi for instant coffee. This is instant coffee. Instant coffee, yeah. Is instant coffee. Is what? Is brewing cooking? What, what, what brewing, is brewing, brewing, is brewing is cooking. Is hot water. Brewing is cooking, hot so water. You're, so you're brewing the tea. I mean, aren't you? As you are, you are as brewing as well, the tea. There are people that have, to, we, today everybody has their own tea bag. There was a time when the tea <laughs> bag was, uh, they put it, they, they brewed the tea before Shabbos. And then they took yeah, the, yeah. The, the it was called it was essence. called it was called essence, yes. right? Okay. People made very strong tea yeah, before right. Shabbos, right. and then poured that tea. Right. Is that an extra step? No, what? that that makes it even better. You could do that with a with a klisheni. Yes. In other words, you don't have to pour into a klishlishi right. because that's already been cooked. That's Joseph, the reason why. Hang, Joseph, hang on a second. Right, right. I understand that Akum. Is, uh, is idol worshippers, uh, but don't we in Judaism? Isn't there a case in the Talmud of a rabbi who, who everything went wrong for him, and this happened that wrong, and they end up in saying that he was born on the wrong mazel? All right, don't we in Judaism believe in mazel? We there's a difference between worshiping mazel yeah. and believing in mazel. Right? We believe in mazel. What do you say to somebody when something good happens? Mazel tov. Right? Every time you say mazel tov to somebody, what are you saying? You're wishing them a good constellation, right? So, so we, right, we believe in, in, we believe that when a Kaddish Baruch Hu created the world, a Kaddish Baruch Hu set things in motion in the world so that our lives can be impacted by mazalos, right, by constellations, by what goes on in the world around us, right? So, so we, we believe that. In fact, the Torah itself tells us that a Kaddish Baruch Hu took Avram Avinu out from under his mazal, right? Took him uh, right outside of his mazal to tell him that, you know, you'll, you'll have, right? Within your mazal you won't, but outside of your mazal you will. I thought individual Jews have mazal, but not the nation of Israel. Individual yeah. Jews have mazel. Well, B'nai Israel, correct, yeah. correct. Mazel, right? Correct. Okay, back to the microwave. Back to the microwave. Okay. I hope I've answered the question there. Dishwasher. Most people do not use a dishwasher for milchix and f separately for milchix and fleshix. And the reason for that, although in Eretz Yisrael it's more common, by the way, in Eretz Yisrael it's more common. Fascinating sociological differences between kashrus in Israel and kashrus outside of Israel. Um, but most people in the United States, or most observant Jews that I'm familiar with, we'll, we'll narrow it down a lot, do not use a dishwasher for both milchix and fleshix. What's the reason for that? <coughs> the reason for that is if you ever cleaned a dishwasher, and most people have never cleaned their dishwasher, <laughs> but if you've ever cleaned a dishwasher, um, what happens is most people, when they, most there are some people who wash their dishes before they put them in the dishwasher. I don't understand those people, but there are people who do that, right? Right? Wash your dishes before putting them in the dishwasher. But if you don't do that, so there's schmutz, right? There's schmutz on, right, on the, on the dishes. What happens to the schmutz on those dishes? Right? It gets washed off of the, hopefully, gets washed off of the plate and settles ultimately in the bottom of that dishwasher. And there is a trap in the bottom of that dishwasher and you can actually find pieces of food in that trap when you clean that trap out. So because of that, in other words, imagine if you have uh, pieces of chicken or meat in that trap and now you're washing your milchik dishes. So most people will not use the same dishwasher for both milchiks and fleshiks so separately. Rex. 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 No, so, so the question is, what are the racks made out of? Steel. Well, the racks, the, racks, the racks are generally made out of metal that are that's covered by hardened plastic. Right, metal cover, covered by hardened plastic. There's a whole debate as to whether or not you can kosher plastic. You can certainly kosher metal. 
question is, can you kosher plastic? And there's a whole discussion. Can you kosher a dishwasher for Pesach or not kosher a dishwasher for Pesach? It's part of that whole discussion. Richard. You know, we don't eat meat anymore, but back about 40 years when we did in our old house, um, what we did with our dishwashers, we had two sets of racks, one for milk and one for flesh. So if we were washing it off, and we always wash okay. the dishes. So I'm glad you don't do that anymore. <laughs> I'm glad you don't do that anymore. <laughs> Okay, so uh, so let's let's come back to Bishul Akum and the let's come back to Bishul Akum and the microwave, right? Right. It is not cooking in the classical sense, right? There is no there is no hot liquid, right? That is cooking, and in fact, not only is there no hot liquid, but there is no dry heat either, right? Theoretically, if you put your you know you. You run your microwave for five minutes and then you stop it and you touch the walls of the microwave, they will not be hot. The walls of the microwave will not be hot. All right, so how does food cook in a microwave? What cooks the food in a microwave? The, the radiation causes the moisture inside the food to vibrate. Thank you, good. And what does that do? Right, correct. The radiation from the microwave cooks the food from the inside out. The food is literally cooked from the inside out. It's not the normal method of cooking. So since it's not a normal method of cooking, there is a whole debate as to whether or not Bishul Akum applies to a microwave. And there is, there is obviously, because it's a Jewish topic, there are those who prohibit it. And there are those who permit it under cases of need. And this is actually a very important heter because more often than not, if a person, and let's say a person is elderly and they have an aide, and the aide is preparing their meals for them, most of the time the aide will be using the microwave. Right? And, and since if there is a leniency, if we can be lenient under these circumstances, and allow the aid to use the microwave, we can save many people um, from having to worry about the prohibition of bishalakum. It's one of the, you know, it's one of the, I get, I, you'd be surprised how many people call, right? I, I need to get an aid for my mother, but, uh, you know, but she's going to be reheating the food or she's going to be cooking the food in the microwave, right? Is that a problem or not? So if there's, so there is a leniency. Uh, Rav Usher Weiss, one of the major post scheme of our generation, is lenient uh, in the case of need to not consider microwave to be the classical case of Bishop. They're, they're less strict, but let's say LED lights, which gives off light and gives off everything, basically. Less strict, yeah, what does it mean, yeah. less strict mean? One would think that a microwave, which doesn't fall into the category of cooking, would automatically be allowed. Like well, I can it, something outside on Shabbos on the sidewalk. It falls. It's not cooking. Right. Well, so mm -hmm. so right. are you talking about when we talk about cooking? You have to talk about what do you you know? Are you talking cooking from a Shabbos perspective? What Let's are you talking talk about? about Shabbos. If, I, if it's 120 degrees outside and I want to warm up something outside, I can put it outside. Right. If it's 120 yeah. degrees outside, the pavement is oh. 120 degrees outside. If I crack an egg on the pavement, I will cook that egg. All right, have I violated Bishel? Have I violated Bishel? And not, so not on a Diorisa level, right. only on a rabbinic level, a yes. Right. On, a rabbin, on a rabbinic level, yes, but not on a biblical level. On a rabbinic level, yes, okay? But that's, that's because the rabbis did not define cooking. They defined cooking by a, um, a heat source other than the sun. Right? In other words, a, a flame, uh, an electric current, something uh, like that. A microwave is other than a flame. No, but, right, so that, that's correct. But when you turn on a microwave, you are using electricity. So, so you, are, you can't do it on Shabbos, right? It's not, you don't even get to the question of Bishul because you're using electricity, right? So the, the, only, the only place where it would be an issue, where it could be a, a question, a leniency, would be in this case of Bishul Akum which is what we're talking about, where you might have, you might have that leniency as a result of it. Okay. What so, if you had to run a timer, let's say for argument's sake, let's say you had an electric stove top, whatever, you put your egg So we've, we've, we've discussed whether or not cooking by a timer is permissible. 
You don't have to go so far as to cook the egg that way. Let's say you, uh, you want to brew coffee. <clears throat> you brew coffee with a timer. You set your timer to brew your fresh coffee. Is that permissible on Shabbos or not permissible? There's a machlokas. There are, you have to have a rabbi and you have to ask the rabbi, you know, how do you paskin? Is it permissible? It's, Rav Moshe did not allow cooking by a timer. But that was Rav Moshe's position. You're not allowed to cook by a timer. Right? So I also tell people they should not brew fresh coffee on Shabbos. I also tell people that. Right? That they should not brew fresh coffee on Shabbos. There are other, there are other rabbis in our community who, uh, who feel differently. Right? I'm a, I'm a little bit uh, stringent when it comes to that. But okay. A couple of other issues. Steve has mentioned multiple times the light bulb issue. All right, what's the light bulb issue? So the light bulb issue is something, I have a, I have a factory and the factory is in Thailand and uh, I can't, I can't, it's too expensive to station a, uh, a Jew in Thailand, the Mashkiach Tamidi, who is going to turn the oven on all the time. So what do I do? So I put an incandescent bulb in my oven that's going to give off a little bit of heat. And the mashkiach, when he's there for his once a year visit, turns on that light bulb, and that light bulb will burn the entire year. Is that, does that obviate the problem of Bishal Akum or not? So there are those, there are those kashrus agencies that do, that do rely on such a heter, right? There are kashrus agencies that will rely on that heter of the light bulb, that saying essentially that the light bulb is, which produces a little bit of heat, a, a minimal amount of heat, is no different than taking a, a wood chip and throwing it uh, into the fire. The OU does not rely on that heter, and other kashrus agencies do not rely on that heter. And the reason why they don't rely, there are two reasons why they don't rely on it. Reason number one is because when the Gemara talks about a Jew taking a wood chip and throwing it onto the fire, the Jew is contributing to the fire that cooks. The light bulb is a separate heat source from the fire that cooks. And since the light bulb is a separate heat source from the fire that cooks, the OU and other kashrus agencies don't rely on it. Interestingly, there might be a second reason as well, and what is that? And that is that, uh, that electric companies often redirect power from one generator to another generator as a matter of course to balance the load so if the if the electricity which is supplying this light bulb comes from generator a and the electric company redirects it so that the electricity is now coming from generator b that might be considered as if the light bulb was shut off and turned back on. And also, wherever you go, somewhere in a year, electricity is going to go off. Power will be lost. Okay, so you have you have that issue also. So, right. So, a, so a light bulb is so a light bulb in the oven is relied on by some, but not relied on by most. There is a very interesting uh, solution to this issue, and what is that? And that is, it is possible now through technology to turn on ovens remotely. Mm -hmm. Now, some of you might have that ability to do with your own ovens. I can do it with my oven at home, not that I ever do it, but I could, my oven at home does have, does have the ability to be turned on remotely, mm -hmm. meaning I could use my phone and I can turn on my oven. Now, obviously, you know, there are certain safeguards built into that, but a kosher's agency could and does rely on the an oven being turned on remotely. Now, in order to do that, you would need to have some way of verifying that the oven is off before you go through the process of remotely turning it on, right? Just to ensure that it, but this is how people deal with, you know, with issues of cooking, primarily when it comes to fish that is, that is steamed uh, in remote locations uh, around the world how kashrus agencies deal with these particular instances. So if you have a generator, let's say you have a power outage on Shabbos, your generator kicks on. Would that be What's the problem? 
I don't know. I'm asking you. Okay, so we, so we, we do have the following. We do have a very interesting question. Uh, Richard raises the question, let's say that I have a generator in my house and on Shabbos my power goes out and what happens? My power goes out and my generator kicks on, right? So what happens to uh, food that I have on the blech? What happens to my cholent, which is plugged in to the, to the wall? It goes off for a minute. Right? It goes off for a minute and then it goes back on. It goes off for a minute and then it goes back on. Is that a problem on Shabbos or not a problem on Shabbos? So the answer depends on how quickly the power is restored. Right. Right. So if you have so if you have a generator which pretty much instantaneously right picks up uh, there's minimal interruption, it's not an issue. Where it is an issue, where we've had cases in the past, and we once had it here in show where we couldn't serve the chalent, is where the power went off, there is no generator, the power went off, and the food cooled down. Now, all right, the power goes back on, and the chalent gets hot again, but you can't use it anymore, right? If that happens, you can't use it anymore. Right, so it's uh, that's an interesting the question. Person hasn't done anything. If I make children, right, hold on a second. Le Leslie is right, right? Le Le what is Leslie saying? Leslie is saying, right? But I haven't done anything. Right? I haven't done right. I haven't done anything, right? It's it cooled off, and then it heated up all by itself, right? That would be akin to a timer, which we would not rely on for cooking. Go ahead, Irash. I, I just I cooked the children. And I want to eat it in the noontime. So I set up the timer to start in the morning. The food is cooked. No, okay. Is not All right. So I can't. So if I'm an Ashkenazi, I can't eat liquid which has been reheated on Shabbos. If I'm a Sephardi, I can. But if I'm an Ashkenazi, I can't eat liquids which have been reheated on Shabbos. Meaning, most cholents are liquidy. Most cholents are liquidy. So what am I, why, I, so if the power goes off and the liquid cools down and then that liquid is reheated, from an Ashkenazi perspective, that liquid is forbidden to, I forbidden to me. It's Bishop. I set up the timer to go on on Shabbat. So that's, so, right so, Shabbat. okay, so that's Rav Moshe. That's the question about Rav Moshe. Right, Rav, Rav, you know, is does Rav Moshe allow, Rav Moshe does not allow the cook a uh, baking or cooking by a timer. That's that's I mean that's no different than uh, than a brewing fresh coffee on Shabbos. It's the same thing. So right, it's the same thing. So why is it okay with the Sephardi and not with the Ashkenazi? Because Sephardim are on a higher madrega than Ashkenazi. Yes, then I'll tell you. Rabbi, when you were talking about the uh, starting your oven remotely, right? So. And that, that would make it too easy for a, a, to allow a non-Jew to push a button 10 miles away and start the oven. So that's why I'm saying you would need to have a mechanism to ensure that right before you turn the oven on, you would be able to verify that the oven is off. Okay. It's because so you're going to put it on. What? If I'm going to put the oven on, pushing the button, would that be usable? Correct. That's correct. But in other words, before the mashkiach pushes the button, he confirms that the oven is off. Now he knows that him turning the oven on is a result of his, what he's doing remotely. I think technology can make it more and more difficult to make okay. okay, everybody have a great, a great week. We'll see you next week.